Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to CISO Talks um, with Media Ops. Today, I am your host, standing in for Alan Schimmel. Um, I welcome today a panel of experts, CISOs and security leaders. Uh, we're going to be discussing security beyond COVID as our discussion topic today. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and their affiliation. Uh, oh, I should introduce myself first. Um, I'm Chen Si Wang. I'm the founder and general partner for Rain Capital, a cybersecurity focused venture fund. I'm a long time cybersecurity uh, person and uh, um, I've collaborated quite a bit with media ops and very happy to be moderating this panel today. Uh, so I'll turn over to my panelists. Um, Algrede, I'll start with you. Well, thank you, Shanti, for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure and definitely an honor. Um, Algerde Pipikaite, I am lead for strategic initiatives at the Center for Cybersecurity with the World Economic Forum. And I am calling in from wine o'clock. Uh, it's uh, late Friday evening here in Geneva, Switzerland. So definitely afterwards, I'll be relaxing. Over to you. And Marcia? Hi, I'm Marcia Main, CISO for Rally Health. I've been with Rally now for about two years. Um, very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And Rinky. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Rinky Sati. I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Twitter, where I've been now for four months. Yes, very exciting times indeed. And uh, um, I will start with Rinky because you are uh, somewhat new uh, CISO with Twitter. And Twitter obviously has um, publicly stated that Twitter employees can uh, work from home indefinitely if they wish to. Um, and we'll start the discussion setting the context of um, beyond COVID, the work environment, how that changes between different uh, companies. And I'll start with you, Rinky. So with Twitter making this public announcement, how do you see the different offices will continue to operate going forward this year and, and forward? Yeah, it's um, interesting. So in joining Twitter, what I learned was prior to COVID, um, actually long before COVID had even started in the US, they had already had a plan to build out a remote workforce and to improve just, we're a very global company and um, what Twitter does impacts people globally and the company needs to represent that. So there was already a push to hire across the globe where we may not have offices um, and just uh, build out a more remote workforce. So when COVID happened, although there were some challenges, it actually, um, we were already staged to be like that. Um, and post COVID, I think there's gonna be a hybrid environment. Um, we've already opened up offices in countries where uh, COVID has been contained and where things are opening up. So, and people are returning to the office, but uh, Chen Shi, as you said, there, we're going to also allow people to continue to work from home or work remotely um, if that's their wish and uh, continue to support an environment that's extremely hybrid. Um, so uh, I think um, we're already operating in that way as things are starting to open up, but it'll be a very hybrid environment with offices maybe having a very different footprint uh, going forward. It may not look like what we were used to uh, before COVID. Yeah. Do you think uh, you'll have a rotating office environment? People will come back in once in a while, or you'll have this really uh, sort of delineation of in-office workers versus remote workers? Um, I think it's going to be a combination of the two. I think where we don't have offices, it'll be permanently remote workers. And where we do have offices, folks will roll in and out. Um, they might coordinate with their teams. Um, I think uh, companies are still working through that. And there's going to be a lot of learnings that we're going to have as we move back into that office environment, which at least um, for the state of California is probably looking like late this year or maybe even into next year that the offices will open. But I think we'll learn. I've seen a lot of um, executives from different co uh, companies that are already starting to plan what might this look like? Will teams have to coordinate together? Which teams would have to coordinate if they want to meet in the office? 
So I, I don't think, I think it's going to be a little bit hiccupy, if you will. And, yeah, you know, companies are going to figure it out as we move back into that kind of roll in, roll out hybrid uh, environment. And Marcia, how about you? How about things with Rally Health? Yeah, it's very similar, actually, because, you know, we're in the healthcare industry, but we operate very much like a cat, uh, tech company because uh, we're, you know, digital health. And um, we, we, um, we did have a philosophy of being in the office if you can. I think a lot of the leaders really wanted that. With COVID, that has changed, you know, and actually this week we, allow, we announced that we're going to have a hybrid model, you know, very similar to what Rick was talking about because where we do have offices, we're switching to hotel and desks, right? So you go, if you want to go into the office, you go take a desk, you know, the schedule ahead of time and uh, and go in. But, and if you want to be fully remote, you still have that opportunity as well. So I think going into kind of that hybrid um, format for us as well. But one thing COVID has definitely changed. I think that was a we favored right being the office most days and that's definitely going to change where we have to just be used to to having a remote team in general even though some people will choose to go to the office a couple of days a week right i think the remote team in general will stay are you um have you been hiring remotely throughout 2020 Yes, that was the big change. Honestly, I had never in my career hired someone without meeting them in person. <laughs> you know, it was, I bet, you know, most leaders experienced this. And at first it was, it was very nerve wracking to me because there is something about that in-person interaction, right? Even if you're hiring them to work in an office that's far away from you, you would have that initial meeting, just, just get a feel for the person, right? Can't do that. It is just... Right. Um, very interesting. We had cases where it really didn't work. And I look back thinking, hmm, would it would have been different, right? If I had had a chance to meet them in person, because it turned out, you know, a few months later that it wasn't a good fit. So I, I, I really wonder, I think it's still to be to be seen. I don't know that I've had enough data, but to be seen just how much impact really in hiring. You know, yeah, I think that's a um, that's a very visible trend is people been hiring remotely throughout 2020. And even when things go back to normal, meaning that the pandemic is over, you certainly not going to bring all these remote workers back to a campus. Um, so that creates sort of the definite hybrid demand, if you will. Uh, now, let me turn over to Algirde. Certainly, World Economic Forum is a different entity than the companies that we've been talking about. Uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how uh, uh, COVID has impacted the your operating environment. Uh, well, of course, but I think first, uh, on, on a very positive and optimistic note, I just I'm very happy to hear that your guys are hiring. And it means the economy is picking up. And actually, we are also very lucky to be in a field that was barely touched from the economical standpoint. So, um, and here at the World Economic Forum, we definitely think about what does it mean beyond technology, this pandemic to us. Uh, we as organization actually underwent quite significant um, changes and optimizations, which is very, very positive. And um, as you may have known, uh, we just wrapped up the first Davos Online, which was last week. Um, it was the first time in 51 years that we have done fully online, um, which I think is brilliant because it brings Davos to the people. Um, and uh, after, you know, we went through transition literally after Davos last year, 2020 because in Europe, pandemic started slightly earlier than it did in the United States. And uh, very quickly, actually, our leadership was able to transition into fully digital, not only for ourselves and our staff, but also to bring the platform to hundreds of thousands of projects and people that wanted to get engaged to actually move the needle forward in improving the state of the world, specifically tackling the COVID-19 challenge. So we built a platform that is uniting around 90,000 of social entrepreneurs working and mobilizing them on COVID-19 um, you know, projects 
we have developed a COVID-19 action platform that unites around, you know, 1,200 largest corporations globally and puts governments together on the same platform and allows them to keep dialogues and projects going that actually save lives and livelihoods. So I think when, when I think about the World Economic Forum and what we underwent in the last almost a year, is beyond ourselves as an entity of around 800 people, um, we actually managed to transition into providing a platform for a social good. And, and that actually is a great satisfaction to be part of it. Yeah. But if I'm thinking, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, finish your thought. I when, when I actually think, listening to Marcia and Rinky and yourself, Chenchi, um, for me, after spending almost a year working from home, from time to time, you know, appearing in the office as a blue moon, you know, just enjoying myself and going back, um, we as humans develop habit, habits in around two months, 66 days. That means our habit to work from home has been established very, very heavily. So I really, like, I'm looking forward to observe leaderships of various institutions that will try to take people out of their homes and how successful will they be. So stay tuned. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, when I think of the three um, uh, entities represented here, certainly uh, Twitter, Rinky, your company um, is more on the, the forefront of uh, modern infrastructure, cloud-based uh, uh, computing. So uh, possibly is less of a shift for your company to move to a fully remote working environment. And what Algirde had just described as uh, um, an organization that used to run in-person events and they have to switch within the, the course of a few months to a fully digital platform, possibly had to go through a significant change. And, and Rally Health and Marcia, you are somewhere in the middle. So it's we have the different points of the spectrum or um, uh, represented here. Um, so I want to go back to, certainly this is a CISO talk. So we're, we're talking about security and security strategies and postures. Um, so I want to start with you, Rinky, again, on um, given that Twitter is, you know, cloud native and very modern infrastructure driven, um, when the company moved to fully remote and, and will continue to be um, very hybrid going forward, um, did your team and your uh, organization, your, your, your security organization, that is, um, have to do things differently because of COVID? Did you have to change your strategies? Did you have to uh, maybe look at security postures and policies differently? Um, any examples there? Yeah, um, I, it's interesting because, um, you know, to what Algarde and um, Marcia just said, I'm actually one of the few folks that changed jobs during, um, or, or one of the many folks that changed jobs during COVID and that too in a CISO role. And so when COVID hit, I actually wasn't with Twitter, I was with Rubrik, and, um, which is a cloud data management startup in the Bay Area here. And um, it's interesting, you know, um, I think Every company faced similar challenges. Some were pre more prepared than others. Um, but even in that, where you completely shift, like every company had to think about how are you going to do all hands meetings now going forward? Or, you know, just folks had to shift how they were doing things. What I saw um, it, both at Rubrik and Twitter, and even customers of um, when I was at Rubrik, customers is there's a huge push to cloud. You can't have people now going to data centers necessarily. Um, and there was a huge push to, we, you know, even companies that were thinking about cloud, I think their cloud uh, journey was accelerated. And all of a sudden there's this small talent pool of cloud security folks that po folks were tapping into that if we're gonna go and transform into cloud, we have to maybe think about how we're doing business differently and really think about security. So there's a huge shift in that way um, I also saw that um, a big pushes towards zero trust, including Twitter, um, because you're no longer reliant on your own networks necessarily. You need to um, kind of rely on a zero trust uh, principle or methodology. And so there's a huge push for that to, to enable um, your remote workforce to be more secure. Uh, so those were some of the areas. And then 
there's some funny things that we hadn't thought about. Like now, if you're thinking thinking about M and A uh, due diligence, um, or you're thinking about what you know, you're you have employees that are at home. There are significant others, and just other people in the house might be overhearing conversations. And how do you protect data as it relates to that, and even just printed documents um, and things like that? How do you teach your employees, and how do you keep secure in um, in this new way of working? So. Um, there were a lot of new things we had to roll out in terms of training. And then again, as I talked about, just this big pushes towards zero trust and acceleration of programs that people had, maybe your companies had planned, but now needed to accelerate and really move forward quickly. Yeah, Marcia, I think I, I want to follow up on that uh, train of thought. For you guys, for your company, you certainly deal with a lot of health data, right? So uh, data protection, data uh, uh, privacy, has that changed the uh, the approach of, of doing that? Has that changed throughout the COVID period? Yeah, absolutely. From a, from a, like an internal perspective, I think our story was very similar to what Reiki was saying because we are, you know, fully cloud native. I think our tax stack is very similar to what uh, she has as well. But from a consumer perspective, right, that you're saying it, it's interesting because I, you know, none of the problems we have right now are new, right? I mean, we we have always had to secure, well, not always, but at least for decades now, had to secure assets and users who are not in the building, right? <laughs> so remote and our business being really digital health um, it has always been in our scope of work. Um, but with COVID, what has been interesting in the, in the health uh, care industry is the push to digital, right? Because we have had the capabilities to do digital health for a long time. But even from a consumer perspective, patients are not very maybe not very comfortable or very interested in telehealth or mobile health and things like that, right? So the adoption was a little slower. Um, COVID just kind of blew that up, right? So the demand for that and the focus on that, I think what's changed for us was, was getting funding, right? And a shift to making sure that security is nimble enough to keep up with that. Because I think honestly, security really, if I had to say regulation, has been a little bit of a hindrance there for digital health, right? We have a very, if you think about HIPAA, where right, there's a very checkboxy, you know, way of looking at security when you're thinking about data protection. And it is huge. I mean, there's a huge risk around PHI. It's, it's serious business, right? And we care about that, obviously, for consumers. But you really need to be risk-based so that you are really asking yourselves, like, is this, is this a big deal enough for me to to stop progress here and enable all this value for our users as well. So I think more and more the changes I felt is 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 room for that, for being nimble, for being more flexible, for being more risk based, um, and that demand for security to adapt fast to to, to enable digital. Health. So um, following that, um, was there an area that you invested in throughout um, 2020? Uh, that you might not have done it uh, without the pandemic happening? Is there a specific, you know, security technology that you've adopted or a product you invested or um, maybe an approach that you adopted that was really to accommodate this new working environment? Yeah, I think internally, right, so you're thinking about, I don't know if you're asking specifically for like our users, right, our internal rally users, or if you're asking about our consumers, right, because I think the, it's a little well, bit. Well, so uh, you can, I mean, whichever example you think is relevant, right, um, or uh, things so. that might, might have accelerated your, your adoption journey or might have been different approach that, that you would have taken otherwise without the, without this pandemic. Yeah, no, I think, you know, internally, I won't speak to it too much because it's the same, um, really the same story that Rinky was talking about it, with zero trust, right? So internally, like I finally got more support and a little bit more investment to expand our zero trust uh, strategy, which has been something I wanted to do anyways, but COVID has brought it to, you know, executive attention and understanding. We needed the funds. And, um, but from a consumer perspective, I think the, the, 
most important thing we were able to, to push more was authentication security tooling, right? Because I think it's something that, you know, Rally is part of um, United Health Group, um, you know, larger organization. And I think one thing that we struggle with, you know, as a whole organization is that consumer identity, right? Think about from a user perspective, how, how touchy this is in the healthcare uh, system, right? It is, it's, it, you know, it gets into eligibility, you get into Medicare, and like it, it's a very complicated system to first identify who are you and what are the things you're eligible for and should get access to, uh, and then securing all of that, like from an authentication and uh, an identification authentication perspective. And so our systems needed investments to do that better. And I think because demand increased so much with COVID for you know digital health that became even more pronounced and we were able to get more funding to make the improvements and the maturity that we've been wanting to do, you know, for, for a couple of years. Uh, but I, that's why, you know, we always say, I would say like COVID has not really necessarily brought up these challenges or we didn't know we needed this before, before COVID, but, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste, if you will, right? I think that was the, <laughs> the part that, it was it was helpful in the sense of highlighting that need and getting attention and getting funding. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, don't let that crisis go to waste. Is uh, um, I think many innovative organizations are definitely doing that with COVID, thinking about exer- accelerating cloud adoption journey, accelerating digital transformation journey. That things that they would have done otherwise maybe in a slower pace, but now. Uh, is being done a little faster, more rapidly. And in the end, hopefully the organization will come out stronger, right? And, and now, Gerte, I'd love to hear about the uh, how World Economic Forum went about building this digital platform, really brought the events to the people, not just to uh, the leaders, but really to the people and how, how you deal with content and everything that going forward. Very good question. And actually, I would build on what Brinky and Marcia said, because they literally took words out of my my mouth, what I would have said. Um, I think, sadly, with the ongoing pandemic uh, and the situation in the world and how much pain it has caused, but on what Marcia said, you know, never let a crisis go to waste, we can look actually through 2020 And we can see that the COVID inflated digitalization actually did a massive favor to cybersecurity. Like we, it's it's kind of like the virologists were talking about a virus coming in and we all knew it is actually a risk. How many of us cared? Very similarly with cybersecurity, we in the field, we know the risks and we know that potential cyber pandemic actually can happen. Now, what did 2020 brought? At first, it brought massively diminished budgets because everyone was in panic mode. We didn't know what's going to happen. Then suddenly, when board level executives had to deal with um, serious M&A discussions, IP situations, and discussing any other risks, suddenly in online channels where we all knew we're not necessarily all secure from the get-go, that became a much more abrupt issue to them. And hence, a lot of budgets were relieved. And exactly the same happens in majority of organizations that at least we touched, we discussed, and we partnered with. And if I may, then on top of the SolarWinds situation that is still ongoing, and we still do not know what is the long-term effect of that breach, Cybersecurity is definitely was in 2020 a board level issue. It was elevated. So when I think about the future, I actually really hope that that will allow us in technology field, so not only security, but actually also technology developers, really start applying security by design, security by default, privacy by design, privacy by default principles that are, for example, in Europe, in European Union already, an obligation by law, the, GT, the, the famous GDPR. But as long as we will not develop technology that is seamless, transparent, and actually user-friendly, we will have to rely heavily on leadership providing more and more funding to protect against the same attack 
vectors that we've been protecting for quite a while. But I think digitalization did us a favor. Please oppose me. Happy, happy to take opposition here. But I think really this crisis, at least for cybersecurity sector, did not go to waste. So I have a, a question for all three of you. Um, do you think with COVID and with the change in IT infrastructure um, and security strategies, everybody working from home um, and cloud, a pervasive use of cloud computing, have we increased our attack surface or have we decreased our attack surface? Um, so I'll go, I'll start with you, Agade, first. The easy question come to me, huh? <laughs> um, I think we definitely have increased attack surface. Now, I might some might say something controversial. Uh, the attack surface has increased. The number of attacks we have seen in 2020 has increased massively by multiple fold, and especially in sectors like Marcius and healthcare, because that was one of the most vulnerable sectors where hackers knew and cyber criminals knew that they will have to pay in case they are successful in breaching them. But at the same time, the visibility and the issue of cybersecurity has been elevated and actually people are becoming and understanding more than a year and a half ago, that each one of us play part in security. So again, we did a lot of trainings throughout the years, but I think through being you know, so dependent on digitalization in every single sphere in our lives, and especially in our breadwinning situation, you know, this, our livelihood depends on being able to connect, everyone is becoming much more aware of the threats um, and I think now we not only gained advantage with the leadership, but we also are gaining advantage with our workforce who are much more aware of the threats, risks, and, you know, basically every day we hear breaches that are quite painful, uh, culminating in so, 2020 with a massive breach. So your position is we have increased attack surface, but we have increased awareness as well, and, and possibly our... Um, a readiness to deal with security incidents. Exactly. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, let me turn to Rinky. What do you think? Increase or decrease in terms of attack surface? And, and, would, and anything you wish to add to that? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't frame it as increase or decrease. We still have an attack surface. 95% of breaches are still caused by human error of some sort. We're still, still, and it's, that's um, an unfortunate reality, right? Breaches are still caused 95% by, um, by human error, whether that's you know, inadvertently uh, doing something in the cloud, um, making something public you shouldn't, or whether it's responding to a phishing um, email or whatever it might be. And so I would say the attack surface, um, you know, it's different in the cloud versus uh, what you do, uh, whether it's in your in your data center. And I think um, it's changed the just, it's changing is what I would say. So we're less susceptible maybe to some of the physical threats that we faced in uh, the non-COVID environment, but we're still susceptible to other threats. Um, and so uh, I don't like putting it as an increase decrease. I think it's different, it's ever changing. And that's kind of, that's why we're in this field, right? In cybersecurity, that it's always an ever changing field. Um, new technologies are entering, which are really exciting. Um, that can help us just prevent from the new um, attack vectors we might see. And we are starting to see that some things are starting to become kind of obsolete. And, you know, again, thinking about your own perimeter is less important for companies now. So I think um, it's just different. So different, but are we, do you think there is a visible change in the way, uh, how ready we are to deal with security incidents in such a hybrid environment? Do you think we're more ready or we're less ready? I mean, here, I, I, I feel like we've been in this situation now for a year, whether we were now, um, it was tough in the beginning when you think about dealing with an incident, just how do you gather a global team together for those that were used to sitting in a security operations center, which I remember I managed that just a few years ago where I had a team sitting in an actual SOC that we had built and that's no longer the case, right? And you realize so much by the banter that happens back and forth 
with the team. Um, and so there's a couple things that have happened. We had to find ways to collaborate and how do you keep a team in sync that needs to be constantly in sync? And they found remote ways of doing that now. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's happened is we're now, because now, um, because of COVID, you can get talent from anywhere in the world. So I think that you're bringing in new thought diversity into how you go and respond to incidents, which will make teams and companies stronger. So um, I, I see it as it was tough in the beginning um, for some companies that weren't already global, that didn't work, didn't have a remote workforce. Um, but I, I think now, as I've talked to my peers in industry, we figured it out and I think um, we're better for it. And there's still some challenges, um, I, I, just a, you know, we always used to joke around in the SOC that um, there's what's the one incident that'll bring like the incident response team down and it's someone getting sick was always the joke that if someone gets sick in a SOC, everybody's going to get sick. And at least that's not the case now. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Um, it's um, you actually stole some of the um, um, future questions that, that I'm going to ask about team culture. Uh, so hold that thought. Uh, and and Marcia, um, I want a quick uh, comment from you about increase or decrease. Um, I know I'm asking these, you know, black and white questions and, and, and you guys all gave a really good answer, but I'd love to hear some more uh, definitive statement about whether you think it's uh, attack surface has increased or decreased or our readiness has improved or or uh, disrupted? Yeah, from an attack service, I think I can give a yes or no answer. I, I feel that it, it has not increased, right? So you think about the, if you think about attack surface as the ways in which, right, we were getting attacked. I mean, so much of what we're doing digitally now, we were already doing, but I think it's the volume of it, right? We're doing more of it. We get people exploiting more of certain aspects of it than others, uh, causing stress, right, in certain areas of risk more than before. But if you think about the surface itself, I would say it's it's pretty much the same with the exception, you know, some of the stuff that um, Ricky mentioned in the beginning, which were things I had to deal with. She was talking about having spouses who can overhear. I guess you can think that of, as a different threat in that surface that we haven't thought about before. Or, you know, I had to change my policy to make sure you mentioned Alexa type devices, right? Don't have that in the room where you were taking consumer calls. So in your house. So yes, there were a few tweaks like that that we had to worry about, but I think in general, I, I feel like I could say it has not changed. Uh, our readiness, you know, was challenged to how much we're ready to respond to that given the volume, you know, but the surface itself, I think is pretty much the same. Great, and I want to um, pivot around to um, the discussion that Rinky actually started for us. Think about the security operations team, right? You used to sit together, and and as um, as Rinky said, a lot of work is done through this background banter, right? And you say, "Oh, uh, have you seen this? Have have you seen this?" And they're just reaching over to the next cubicle, and that doesn't happen today, right? So. Um, if I want to talk to my teammate, I have to advance uh, in advance, set up a meeting. Everything is sort of intentional. There's very little sort of a, a, um, a accidental connections happening that that in this uh, virtual world. Um, and I'm hearing a lot about companies having to uh, instill a more human centric culture, um, for the lack of a better word, um, is um, essentially be more intentional about caring for the human as an employee, um, because you don't have that in person connection. And has that change? Um, has that change impacted how you run your team or, or really how you run your corporate security um, as, a, as a whole? Um, and, and have you really thought about how human-centric approach changed the way you do business? Uh, and um, I'll start with you, Agarde. Um, well, has it changed? Of course, dynamics have changed drastically because you also cannot organize the after office extracurriculum activities. Yeah, like you, you were even avoiding creating interactions that 
before we used to use as team building exercise. Um, you lost um, capabilities in, in bringing new people, onboarding new people and actually introducing them in like a, a team environment. So, so a lot of things have changed and I believe it, it builds not only for, for, for the 2020 or the upcoming year in 2021. I think it's a much bigger um, highlight that we as leaders and managers of teams will just need to be much more creative. I think 2020 also showed a lot of issues on inclusivity, integrity, diversity. So even going beyond of thinking of your current team environment, how to operate, I think we, and I would hope so, um, we are becoming much more aware of family situations of people. We are much getting much more aware of people's health you know, because we have this pandemic so much on our face that suddenly where we expected people actually to jump on that call when they were sick, we are much more now giving more space for actual healing. Um, I think we also became much more of a, uh, aware of mental health because being locked, you know, 24 seven in the same environment, especially if you are in a smaller environment, especially if, or if you are by yourself or if you are with smaller kids, it's just, I think, 2020 allowed us to take a step back within our teams, within our organizations, and actually look at each other from much more human point of view. As much as we love technology, now we are using technology to connect with each other. And at least I have seen a lot of that happening within my team, within my organization, and coming directly from you know the, the top level of leadership. Uh, we definitely have much more town halls happening where, you know, even from smaller issues are being addressed. Um, and, and I think 2020 overall was a year of a lot of human change. And I think that will bring us only for the positive. Yes. Um, so I'm looking for comments from Rinky and Marcia, um, but maybe a little bit more on um has this change impacted your um, your way of handling human risks, like you know employees dealing with phishing, things like that? Has it changed at all for security postures dealing with human risks? Um, I think we've been dealing quite well. With, Sorry, um, okay, Jay. Sorry, um, I, I wanted to throw this question to the other two. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you asked them to wait. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Go ahead. So, was he saying, yeah, I muted myself. Okay. <laughs> I can start. Um, see, you know, I think I want to say no. I mean, it's a great question. But I want to say no, because I think security has always focused on the human element, right? If you're thinking about a threat actor, you're thinking about their behavior, their motives. Um, if you're thinking about your users, or you're thinking about what do they need? Um, what is their behavior? From what device are they, are they connecting um, through? Same as our consumers, you know? So I just feel, again, maybe it was, it's easier to talk about it and it brings more to the forefront for people who are not in the field. But I, I think we've always been human centric, you know, as um, Ricky said, really, you know, spot on. It's typically a human error. Because yeah, it's that's true. So that's true. We've always yeah. <laughs> been on that yeah. road. And Rinky, any anything to add here? Do you think do you agree with Marcia's comment about we have always been the human centric and this hasn't really changed that much? I you know, um, what's interesting is when I know this happened to me personally, but I like um, what Algerda uh, um, brought up in terms of the mental health um, pieces. I don't, COVID affected mental health of people in ways that I've seen on my own team, uh, teams, I should say, um, and just my family members. Um, and it, it then adds this additional stress that you don't realize in terms of mistakes people might make or just insider threat type things that might come up um, from a security perspective. Um, you know, usually when you're in a workplace and I like, 
I miss being around people. And I do not think you can replace that no matter what. I think there's certain things that companies have gotten better about and thinking about how to operate it with a remote workforce, but it does not replace human interaction. And just knowing that you spend most of your day at work um, and, you know, pre-COVID, you would go into the office and if you had concerns about something, you might talk to a colleague and, you know, someone might, um, you know, be able to influence you in certain ways. That's not necessarily the case because Chen Shi, as you mentioned, like folks now have to be very intentional about scheduling a meeting. And if they're, you know, it's not going to be about, hey, I'm feeling a certain way. And then that may manifest itself into accident, like things that are mistakes at work. And I that then becomes insider threat in my opinion. And so I think like thinking about that risk from a security perspective has been huge. So then to, for me, I think at least with my own team, as much as I can try to have like transparent conversations, we're always talking about, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling about things right today? And I want to just do check ins. Um, and as you know, that's kind of how conversations start. And the main reason is, you know, think, I, I want to make sure people feel like they have an outlet to bring up concerns. So it doesn't manifest itself into, um, you know, inadvertent or intentional um, uh, in, insider type cases. And I think I see more leaders, uh, um, especially really good leaders doing that more uh, for not just for that reason, but just because they care about their employees. That's a really interesting point about, um, you know, how some of the things you cannot do in this environment could lead to inadvertent security uh, consequences. Um, so love to have a, a maybe a separate conversation on that. Um, but we are coming to the end of our period time, the allocated time here. Um, so what I want to do is quickly go around the table and give you all um, uh, very quickly one uh, parting comment about because our audience are security practitioners. So one thing for them to think about for security, uh, significant security strategy change maybe, or one um, security investment they should be thinking about going forward with this new work, hybrid work environment in mind. Um, so who wants to start? I'll start with you, Rinky. Your, your mic is unmuted. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, I, I think the biggest change um, for me and I, you know, I'm very passionate about us bringing diversity into tech and into cybersecurity. And I think keeping your mind open in terms of talent and what you're looking for and where might that be, I think possibilities are endless and we've been, companies have now been enabled to have a global workforce. And so I think that's the big change and my big thought that, um, and, you know, that I continue working on is you know, really bringing in that diverse thought leadership so we can solve the biggest cybersecurity challenges that we have. And I think one thing that COVID has enabled us to do is do exactly that. Fantastic. Marcia, one last comment. Yeah, I would say, you know, it may sound too practical, but if you have not gotten on the Zero Trust train yet, uh, do, because as we go forward, this is going to change and more remote and users connecting from different places will continue. Um, Make sure you get on that train. Great, and Algirde? Amen to you both. <laughs> and um, if, if I can just build, you know, on, on what Rinky said, people, diversity, inclusion, and taking care of the people that you have, upskilling them, allowing them to grow, um, even in this environment, there are plenty of opportunities, and also keeping an open mind in, in, in the economical hardships of where might be those pockets where you create the biggest opportunities. And in cybersecurity, the opportunities are limitless. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I, I have to say, I learned a tremendous amount myself through the conversation today. And thank you all for taking time to be with us. And I'm sure we will get lots of comments and questions from the audience. And I love to continue this conversation off screen. Um, again, thank you so much.